Hello once again and welcome to the final Percussive Arts Society Friday Fundamentals presentation for summer 2023. My name is Christopher Wilson. I'm a member of the PAS Education Committee as well as the chair of the Fundamentals Subcommittee. It's my pleasure to introduce our final clinician of the summer, Dr. Jeffrey Berardin. Dr. Berardin is an accomplished performer and pedagogue who can be heard on the Grammy-winning album Songs of Innocence and Experience and who has also worked closely with composers such as Michael Dougherty and Bright Sheng. He is the Director of Instrumental Music at Abington Friends School and is an adjunct music instructor with Maryville University. His clinic today is titled A Smashing Success, Elevating Your Symbol Game. On behalf of PAS and the Education Committee, I hope you enjoy today's presentation. Hi, my name is Jeff Berudin, and I'm here today to talk to you about orchestral and concert band cymbal use. Before we get into playing technique or things like that, I just want to talk very briefly about some of the cymbals, accessories, and other things that you might need uh, to basically outfit your ensemble. And this really goes for most levels. If you're elementary, we can kind of get away with some stuff, but especially once we're getting into middle school and above, you are gonna to wanna to have some optionality. So you're gonna to wanna to start by having at least two pairs of crash cymbals. And you're gonna to wanna to have one of them on a smaller size, about 16 or 17 inch, and then one of them a larger size, 18 or 19. Those are good places to start. Um, you're gonna want them to not be too heavy. You want them to be a good medium weight, also not too light. Uh, the lighter a cymbal is, the more potential there is for inversion and things like that. Medium weight is the way to go. With your crash cymbals, you're not looking to have those pads on uh, that like knuckle protectors. No, we don't need those. Straps only, that's the way to go. And you also might notice that I'm using a cymbal cradle right here. These are great pieces of hardware to have as part of your ensemble. If you have the wanger cabinet, you probably have the cradle that comes with it, but this freestanding uh, set is also great to have. Suspended cymbals, same idea. You're gonna wanna have one big, one small. I've got a 16 inch here, and then I've got a 21 inch here. This is a little larger. This is a ride cymbal actually, but I think it sounds pretty good as a suspended. But 18, 19, even 20 inch, uh, if it sounds good, you're looking to have at least one big and one small. Uh, also, when it comes to suspended cymbals, you'll see that I have both of these on stands. You also have the option of uh, tying a strap and hanging them from a gooseneck, if you like. That's totally legit, that's fine. The gooseneck does become a little bit of a single-use item, um, but and I find these just be a little easier to keep, uh, um, keep around. You also want to have your accessories. And so you definitely wanna have some spare straps lying around. You're definitely gonna to wanna to have a nice collection of felts, and then sleeves, washers, wing nuts, things like that. You can buy all of those individually through percussion distributors like Steve Weiss, and I really recommend having just spares because those little items are ones that go really quickly. There's a company also called No Nuts, and they make this item, which is basically just a replacement for all the things I just mentioned. And you can see that I've got my large symbol with a No Nut. There is no felt. I just put the symbol through there, and it basically, it's not gonna fall off. It's gonna uh, resonate really nicely. I definitely recommend getting some No Nuts uh, for your ensemble. Uh, and then of course you're gonna wanna have, um, well, this is a secondary item. Uh, if you're looking for that sizzle uh, sound, then you know, you've know you got the Promark rattle chain right here. This is a great little thing that you can have on hand if you need that sizzle sound. Uh, but then as far as mallets go, you want, in, you want dedicated suspended cymbal mallets. You don't want mallets that you're also going to use on keyboard instruments or any other instrument or things like that. It's always a good idea because cymbals tend to get a little dirty um, and you know you don't wanna have transfer from that to a keyboard instrument or something like that. It's also just really good for the control of your ensemble. If you say like, nope, the blues, 
are only for symbols. If your students know that, then that's a really good way for them to always have, always be on the same page. They always know what they're using. There's no confusion around that. I want to take this opportunity to show you how to tie a symbol knot, just in case this is something that you're unsure of. You're going to take your symbol strap and you're going to take the four little straps and you're going to line them up. It doesn't really matter in which order, but you do want to make sure that you're getting a nice flat situation like that. This makes it easier to get them through the symbol hole itself. As you're pulling it through then, at this point in the strap, where they, the arms join, you want to try to get pulled through up to that point. If it's not, then it's not going to be as secure a knot as you could possibly get. So now that you're here, we're just going to go in kind of a 90 degree area. You want to try to work with the directionality that the straps are giving you. I've got mine set up now in an X. And I'm just going to start with this first one over, leaving some room, and then I'm gonna continue. Over, over, and then with this last one, I'm going to go over, and then underneath that original loop, this loop right there. I'm gonna go underneath, there we go. So now all that's left is to tighten it up and you're just gonna go arm by arm until you've got a pretty solid knot. And there you go. That's your symbol knot and you're nice and secure, you're ready to go. When we're talking about suspended cymbal, of course there are lots of implements that you can use. Wooden drumstick, brushes, bows. Uh, today we're just going to focus on single rolls or single hits uh, using wrapped mallets. Um, one of the things that you want to think about as you approach the cymbal for the technique that you want to use, think about the cymbal as a clock face. And you want to really aim for the 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock position. You want your mallets to be about there on the cymbal. A lot of times when students roll on suspended cymbals, I see them rolling here, like this, uh, because that's what they're used to from snare drum and timpani and things like that. But when you're here, you're not going to activate as much of the cymbal's body as if you were here. Being here, you're equally setting yourself up for activating as much of the cymbal as quickly and effectively as possible. Um, just like with any uh, roll uh, on a typical percussion instrument, you want to think about how the speed is going to impact the performance. Sim suspended cymbal roll speeds typically are slower than what people think they should be. If people think, oh, I'm doing a forte crescendo, I should be going real fast, and that's not always the case. Um, you want to make sure that you're going at a pace where you're not choking off the natural resonance of the cymbals. Uh, we're aiming for that sustained sound without any mallet impact sound and without any um, taking away from what the instrument is going to do itself. Think about a bass drum roll or a tam-tam roll. It's basically the same idea. You want to work with what the instrument is giving you and how it's speaking in relation to your strokes. So instead of rolling, for example, really fastly from the beginning like this, frantic we can kind of hear those impacts but if I slow it down a little bit you can hear there's more cymbal sound in that roll and it's no and it's just as loud as, as the other one when we're doing our crescendos of course we're going to start slower as we are softer and we gradually speed up as we go also I like to start my rolls with a double tap as opposed to with one hit 
That's more of a personal preference. I feel as though it activates the symbol a little quicker, but that's really kind of up to you and up to the performer. Here's one with the smaller symbol. So those are your rolls. Of course, if you were gonna be doing a day crescendo, same idea in that you're gonna start a little faster and slow your roll, roll down as you are getting slower. When you're doing single strokes on suspended cymbals, you wanna stick with that three and nine directionality. You don't want to hit a cymbal here, and as much as possible, you want to hit the cymbal with two mallets as opposed to one. Again, it's about activating as much of the cymbal as possible. Also, it's not a bad idea to try to go for a little bit of a flam when you're doing a single stroke. It just adds a, a flavor to the hit that many people find pleasing. Um, it's just something that is, uh, it it's a, goes beyond just a, just a regular old hit. Here's a, just a basic hit. Fine. And here's one where I'm just slightly going to flam my, uh, my mallets. It just has that little extra zing to it. But that's what you want to think about, again, always three to nine, always reacting to what the instrument is giving you as far as its own natural resonance and making sure that you're not rolling too fast. All right, so now we're gonna talk about crash cymbals. For a lot of students, crash cymbals um, seem like there's no technique to it. You just pick up two plates and you smash them together. And there is a lot of nuance to getting a good cymbal crash. And I'm gonna walk you through some of the basic technique and some of the troubleshooting ideas, things that I have seen as an educator that I think are gonna really help your students get the best possible cymbal crashes they can get. We're gonna start from the beginning, how to hold the cymbals. Now, cymbals, have straps. If you, um, I should have mentioned earlier, if you've got like those wooden handles, please get rid of those. Awful. Um, you always want to have a strap with your crash cymbal. And it's a bit deceptive because when there's a strap, a lot of times students think, oh great, I get to go through here. And no, that's not what we're looking for, particularly in a concert or orchestral setting. We're not going to put a, go through the strap. Really the idea is we don't want to get caught up with having to like do this, if we have to move to another instrument, if we wanna just you know quickly and efficiently pick up the cymbals and then put them back down. So we're gonna grab by the strap. You're going to treat your pointer finger like it's a table. And the strap is just going to sit on your pointer finger right there. And then your thumb just goes on top. Think about the way you would hold a key as you put a key into a lock kind of the same idea. When you're here, as opposed to here or, or some other weird things that I've seen students do, what we're trying to do is avoid as much contact with the bell of the cymbal as possible. And so this is how we're going to do that. You might also think about the idea of if you're trying to, trying to pull the strap through the hole. And that's going to give you as much control and the least amount of contact that we are trying to get. So that's our hand position right there. Probably the most egregious problem that I've seen with students playing crash cymbals is that they keep them too close to their body. These things are heavy and it is not always the most comfortable thing to prepare for a crash and do a and crash. And so a lot of times the cymbals will be kind of like right next to their body, right here. And you can see that like my elbows are kind of right in with my torso. And that's not the technique that we're looking for. You really want to encourage your students to get your elbows away from your body, get the cymbals 
away from your body. I always think about holding my cymbals about there. Looks like there's about four, five inches of clearance from my body to me, okay? You wanna be out here, and you might have a hard time convincing your students of this because, you know, this hurts more. <laughs> but it's temporary, you know? And so try to appeal to them in that, like, you know, we're gonna get a much better sound. This is something that's gonna make you feel real proud about how you crash cymbals. You kinda wanna to appeal to like, don't, you know, feeling good about what they're doing. Okay, so I'm set up here, and you can see the way that I'm setting up my cymbals. I've got my, it doesn't really matter right or left-handed, uh, I am right-handed, and so my right-hand cymbal is gonna be straight up and down, and my left hand is gonna be at about of an angle. I don't know, 30 degree angle, something like that. This is my setup. And the reason this is my setup is because in slow motion, I'm gonna be flamming these plates together. There's gonna be an imp initial impact there. And then that's gonna bring the left hand plate up for that impact as we go through. As opposed to this motion, which of course is gonna almost definitely give you air pockets and is never going to sound good, okay? Um, no matter what technique you use, the most important thing to keep in mind is that the cymbals are always offset. If the cymbals get to a point like this, where they are aligned, that's air pocket time. And that's where you're gonna get that real sucked cymbal sound that no one likes and you're gonna to have to reinvert the cymbal, which no one likes. So I'm out here, I've got my setup right here, and I'm basically going to go down with my right hand, up with my left hand. They're gonna meet and then they're gonna follow through. So I'm gonna show that to you and then I'm gonna show you what I see a lot of students do when I teach this technique and how to kind of avoid that. So here's our crash. Here it is again. Okay. Now a lot of times when I'm having students do this, what they'll do is they will avoid the, uh, the actual clashing of the cymbals. They'll avoid it and they'll do something that looks like this. We're not gonna be achieving that flam that we're looking for. And you're never gonna be as consistent when you're doing that kind of motion. And so I always talk about the oval motion. Our right hand is basically doing this. Our left hand is basically doing this. And so put that together. And there we go. You do it that way often enough and you'll get used to the feel of the impact of the plates. It won't be a big deal and then you won't have to worry about inconsistency. Okay, so let's say that we're pre preparing for a a really big fortissimo crash. That's about what I've been doing this whole time. I'm ready and... You saw I gave a little bit of a wind up, a little bit of a knee bend, that's cool. Whatever works for you. Now, of course, all of our crashes are not always loud. Sometimes we're talking about softer crashes as well. When it comes there, again, remember the most important point, offset symbols. And so as we bring our symbols a little closer together, we still wanna make sure looking at them that they are offset. And then it's just gonna be about the same idea, just on a very smaller level. And of course, I've only got these symbols, and so I don't have lots of different options to explore timbres and tone color and things like that. Um, if you have a, a pianissimo crash, a thinner symbol sounds lovely, uh, but that's not always the case in a K-12 setting. Now, I've got my other pair of symbols here because sometimes uh, we are programming marches. 
Um, and symbol parts for marches are punishing. They're a little challenging. Uh, just in that the symbol rarely stops, you're asking your student to hold the symbols out here for a real extended period of time. And we're looking for consistency more than anything else, keeping in mind that like for marches, when symbols are playing all the time, we're not expected to like, the symbols aren't the primary thing we should be listening for. And so we're not looking for really loud strokes, of course. If we're playing a march part, then it's gonna be similar to the pianissimo strokes uh, that I just uh, demonstrated, but not as, I'm not gonna be trying as much to touch and, and things like that. It's really just more of a consistent motion. motion going, but it's just on a smaller scale. And of course, for marches, anytime you have a repetitive cymbal part like that, definitely go for the smaller size cymbals because that is absolutely going to help save their energy. It's going to save their arms and muscles and all that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, one of the things hopefully you've been noticing about my playing is that I'm not uh, demonstrating uh, any real poor posture or anything like that. Um, getting the arms in here, but also kind of like, oh, they're so heavy. Oh, you know, you got to encourage your students to kind of, you know, pretend there's a broomstick taped to their back. Really make sure they're standing up nice and tall, making sure that like, have them do arm exercises with the cymbals. You know, just imagine them being able to work all the way around because that's gonna help them feel comfortable being out here instead of in here. One thing I haven't discussed is muffling the cymbals. So say you have a secco, a dry crash that you're looking to choke off afterwards. Um, of course, we do that by bringing that into our torso right here. And you wanna make sure that there's no way around it. If you do it too slowly or too lightly, you don't muffle the cymbals you kind of have to get used to that feeling of really pressing them into your torso. Anything less and you get this. All that the extra harmonics still going, the ring, the DK happening much more gradually. And so you want to make sure that your students, again, are not shying away from that and also some students might want to explore different places to crash. I've seen some um, by uh, muffling, bringing into their armpits like this. That's not bad, um, but that's a little more, it's a little more work. Like that, as opposed to there. Um, but the thing about a lot of percussion instruments and the thing about symbols just like anything else is a lot of it is subjective to uh, a person's body type um, a person's preferences and also the kind of sounds that the ensemble director is looking to get from their percussion section and so all of the things that I've talked about here are generally uh, considered to be good technical performance uh, advice uh, but it doesn't mean that it's the only way to play them. It basically just means that this is a way, a, per, a place for people to start off. And then from there, you can kind of think about, oh, well, how can I make this more personalized for me, make this the most comfortable approach that's gonna work for me while still getting the sound that I'm looking for. All right, thanks very much. Thank you, Jeff, for your fantastic clinic. And another big thank you to all of our presenters this summer and to all of you for watching. If you're interested in participating in a virtual fundamental session, you can contact me. And the submission process for PASIC 2024 will be open after PASIC 2023 this November. So if you have a session you'd like to present next year for our fundamental series at PASIC, please don't hesitate to submit an application at PASIC.org. For more information on PAS committees, head over to PAS.org today.